before the throne of God. be no more debt. The, the, it'll just be a, a time when we get to see Jesus. So when we sing this out, think about the day you get to see Jesus. We'll sing on a second here together. Oh! 
singing this morning. I guess you can hear why I'm not leading singing. And I caught a bit of a cold and just kind of sat in overnight. So I appreciate your prayers. We'll try to get through uh, the message this morning. But let's have a word of prayer and ask God's blessing. You know what? We've been singing some good songs this morning. And I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus, aren't you? What a day that will be. Let's sing that together. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Looking forward to being before the throne of God above. And what a day that will be. So let's sing it together. Cody, you come and lead that for me, will you? What a day that will be. There is coming a day. What a day that will be. is even a hope or a dream unless you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, and no man can come to the Father unless we go through him. He is the way of salvation. I hope you know Jesus as your Savior today. And uh, if you're looking around and wondering where some people are, every year there's a group that goes away up to Buckhorn and they, they go fishing and camping for a week. And this is Buckhorn Sunday, I guess. And so if you thought you missed the rapture, you did not. We're glad that you're here. And uh, you pray, pray for them. They'll be in church up near Peterborough today and uh, having a good time of fellowship up there, camping and fishing. So uh, I kind of wish I was with them sometimes. Amen. I like to fish, and, and uh, they, I, I hear all the fish stories, and, uh, but without photographic proof, I don't believe a word of them. So let's have a word of prayer and ask this blessing on our service today. We're so glad you're here. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for all that you've done for us. Lord, yesterday there was a, a long list of people that, that were not well, and Lord, Brother Paul will rehearse those names at the end of the service, but we just pray that you're care and keeping would be upon them today, that the great physician would remind them that he loves them, that he's near. Lord, we pray that you bless this service, Lord, and and I I need my voice, Lord, and I pray you touch me. Lord, but I'm so glad that in our weakness you're made strong. So I pray, Lord, that you'd show yourself mighty today, and Lord, bless the worship, the singing. May you be glorified and praised, and Father, be with those that are away today, some on vacation, others together up at Buckhorn, and we pray, Lord, that you'd give them a refreshing time, coming back recharged and ready to serve you again. Father, bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay standing, please. Let's sing, Tell Me the Story of Jesus.
Amen. We'll sing out one more song here together. Jesus saves. The new edition. Newer edition.
for a word of prayer and then children you can be dismissed for your junior church hour heavenly father we're thankful once again to be able to meet help us never take that lightly lord to be able to meet assembled like this pray that you bless the preaching in this auditorium that's going to take place that your holy spirit would guide and give pastor the strength and, and wisdom lord pray for the junior church and the kids in, in junior church maybe lord you'd call one of them to be a, a pastor or a missionary or just faithful to you. We pray that you bless in a way that only you could do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Children, you are dismissed. Amen. Let's take our Bibles. Please turn to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1 this morning. <clears throat> we have a very busy next Sunday, and I... I encourage you to pray with us about it. Dr. Sisk will be with us preaching a Father's Day message in the morning. We also are going to recognize graduates next Sunday morning. Not, and next Sunday night, of course, is our academy graduation and awards night. But in the morning service, we're going to recognize graduates from all through our church. And so we have quite a list already compiled, and they'll just put them in the bulletin. We're not going to overshadow Father's Day. We're just going to put their names in the bulletin and recognize their accomplishments, uh, senior kindergarten uh, grade 8 and also high school and college. So if you know of somebody in your family that comes to church here, and just make sure we have that name at the office this week, and we'll get that in the bulletin for next week. And we'll just have a small gift for them to let them know we appreciate them and encourage them to keep going. And then, of course, next Sunday night, well, uh, next Sunday morning is Father's Day, and Dr. Sisko will preach a Father's Day message. And then Sunday night is our graduation award ceremony, and Dr. Sisko will preach that. Starting Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we'll have some special meetings each night. And I'd encourage you uh, to be in prayer for those special meetings. We're looking forward to them, and uh, it'll be a blessing to you. So let me say this next Saturday night, uh, we're gonna we have prayer time here every Saturday night about 4:15. And I would encourage you to come, and let's pray for those special meetings, all right? As many that can come, the better. And uh, sometimes men get over here, and ladies get over here, and we just pray. And uh, we get ready for Sunday primarily, but I want you to pray specifically for these revival meetings that we're having starting next Sunday. And so we will uh, put out an email about that, but mark your calendar, 415 next Sunday, or next Saturday afternoon, and uh, we'll look forward to time, time of prayer together. This morning I was reading in Revelation chapter 5, you know, we just sang before the throne of God above and oh, I want to see him. And it, I, sh I shared with my wife, it kind of dawns on me that I don't think we have a, a very good vision of what the throne of God is really like. 
And uh, we, we picture a throne, we always come back to what we know. And so we see a throne in Buckingham Palace or a king's throne, and that's kind of what we picture. And, and I'm not saying that the throne of heaven is not like that. I don't know. But I do know that God is a spirit. And so to be seated upon a throne is, is kind of an odd thing. But you'll notice in Revelation chapter 4, the Bible talks about one that sat upon the throne. But in Revelation chapter 5, I noticed this morning that the Bible says the Lamb, who of course is Jesus Christ, stood in the midst of the throne. God is seated there. Jesus stands there. And it seems like the, the throne of God might be a, a platform for God's glory. In general, now there may be thrones sat upon it for Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. But it just seems like, uh, I don't know about you, but when I read little things like that, it stretches my thinking. It gets me wondering. And here's what I do know about heaven. I have not seen, nor hath ear heard, all those things that God has prepared for us. And so I look forward to seeing what it's all about one day, and what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And so let's look this morning at Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. And uh, we'll, we'll go as long as we can here. And I, I want to give you uh, two main points with some principles underneath. And we notice a couple things take place in Exodus chapter 1. Number one, we're going to call it change. Change. Change is inevitable, isn't it? And we see our, our society being upheaved. And, and a lot of you would say, well, this is not the country I grew up in. This is not the same Canada I knew as a child but if, if we were being honest and you went back to your grandparents or great-grandparents that were uh, born in the 20s or the, uh, even the late 1800s or something, they would likely say the same thing. This is not the country I grew up in. Uh, they, they lived in a very different time prior to wars, and then wars begin to break out, and, and evil uh, spread across the world. And, and so there's always change taking place. But the second point I want to make today is the challenge. With the change comes challenges. How do we retain certain things as children of God amidst a world that is changing? And so let's look at Exodus chapter 1 today. We see a great market change take place in the life of Israel. The Bible says, now they, uh, these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob. And you'll notice all the names of the tribes of Israel I'm not going to read them all just to save my voice. Verse 5, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. So representing the nation of Israel, we have 70 that migrate into Egypt, but we also have Joseph and he has at least two sons and he has a wife. And so there's at least 74 and perhaps uh, Joseph has a daughter or something that the scriptures does not mention, but at least we know Ephraim and Manasseh have been born. Verse six, and Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. So Israel truly is growing. And we wonder why uh, God moved them into Egypt in the first place. Here was a people that were dwelling among the Canaanites. And if they were to go to battle with just a family of 70 people, it is not likely that, that they would won, uh, win very many victories, save God. God can win any victory he wants to win. And we know that Abraham actually had a battle early on in his life with just his family and his servants, and they defeated the city. But here we see that God is seen in his sovereignty to move them into this place called Egypt. Joseph tells us why. At the end of chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 49, he says, God sent me here to preserve life. What you meant for evil... God meant for good. And so Israel had a purpose in going into Egypt. There was, there was this time that they went. And of course, Joseph was a trusted member of society. He had risen to second in command of all of Egypt. But notice what it says in verse 8. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Somehow Joseph's influence did not carry on. 
A new king came along, and this fellow did not know who Joseph was. He did not regard Joseph. The word know there is much like the Bible word we talk about many times through Scripture. It is to have an intimate relationship with. And I don't mean intimacy in the sense of a husband and wife, but intimacy is that they were close that he was trusted, that it was somebody he would hand things over to and allow him to lead among the people. And so that was not the case any longer. Verse 9, and he said unto his people, behold, the people of children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, They join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives of which the name of the one was Shipra and the name of the other Pua. I, you know what? We're going to stop for a moment. These two midwives, these two ladies are heroes. We're going to read about why in just a moment, how they defied the king and they obeyed God. And so I want you to say their names because their names are worth repeating. The emphasis is on the end, on the awe. All right, say it with me. Shipra, Pua. Shipra and Pua. Say it together. Shipra and Pua. Mark those names in your mind. We don't, after the passing of the 12 leaders of Israel, these 12 tribes, we don't have very many leaders in Israel until Moses comes along. They've been an oppressed people. But these two ladies did a great thing for God. We're going to see a little bit more about that in a moment. Read on with me. Look at verse uh, 16. And, when he, and he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, they, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing, and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Now, the Bible does not indicate at all that these two ladies lied. I believe that God's grace allowed the Israelite women to deliver those children without a midwife. I think they're telling the absolute truth. God knew what was going on, and so he allowed them women to go into labor and to deliver very quickly before the midwives can even make it there. And they said, our job is done. We don't have to kill these children. And that's what they reported to the Pharaoh. Now, look what it says in verse 20. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives. I have warned you before, we need to be careful looking at biblical examples unless God endorses those people. And God, in fact, endorses these midwives. He dealt well with them. God was pleased with what they did. And the Bible says, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. He increased their families. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Let's pray. Father, help us, Lord. Uh, Lord, these folks are going to have to endure my voice for a few moments, and I pray that you'd strengthen it and help me not to be a distraction. We just pray, Lord, that I'd be able to communicate the truths of God's word. Lord, more importantly, that the Holy Spirit would communicate it to our hearts. Speak to us today and help us to understand this passage of Scripture to rightly divide the word of truth and to make application 
where application is found. And so, Father, bless us, we pray. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we read this passage of Scripture, we see a lot of change take place, don't we? We see a time when Israel was doing very well, and God was blessing Joseph and his family, and they were prospering, but change came. A new king rose up that knew not Joseph. And we see that persecution began to arise. I want to be clear this morning that God's people have always been a persecuted people. I'm not saying about uh, the situation here in Canada. I think that one day we will see persecution. But I'm saying that as a whole in society, as a matter of fact, if I can make this comment, we are blessed to be in Canada. And have the freedom that we have to gather here this morning and preach the word of God and sing praises to our God. There are many nations on this earth that what we are doing is considered a capital offense. My son just uh, returned from Egypt and he was telling us some of the things that they had to do. He said we wanted to take some books over for the pastors that would gather at this conference. He said each of us were only allowed 15 books to carry into the country. And they had to be 15 different books. Because if I had 15 of the same, they would know we were distributing Christian literature. So he says, I had 15 different books, and the next person had 15 different, and we all carried a bag with 15 different books. And we went through, and and, and they believed it was for personal use, and we distributed those to the pastor. He says, we were allowed to have a service together, but we were not allowed to tell anybody about Jesus. You'd go to prison if you told somebody about Jesus. You're allowed to already gather Christians that are already saved people, but you're not allowed to evangelize. God has blessed us, and that we have those freedoms, but we must not take them for granted, for they may not last forever. Israel, perhaps, took it for granted. That phrase always strikes me when it says, a new king rose up that knew not Joseph. Somehow, somebody dropped the ball. Somebody allowed their influence to slide. I've been a bit of a family history buff and learning about our genealogy. And I, I learned that where my mom lives even now is called Doan's Hollow. And where my, my great-grandmother was a Doan. And, and so we're related to this Doan family. And I, I began to look and I noticed that in our hymn book, there was a fellow by the name of William Howard Doan. And I looked back at my family tree and went back seven generations and there was William Howard Doan. He was friends with Fanny Crosby and he wrote a lot of, the, uh, of the, the, the music for the words that she would pen. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying is one of his songs. Two generations after William Howard Doan, there are spiritualists in our family. They had come to, uh, to, to Ontario as United Empire Loyalists and they started a spiritualist church That's a demon worship church in Port Dover some 200 years ago. Somebody dropped the ball. They said, well, maybe it was the next generation. William Howard Doan had two daughters. One was named Marguerite Doan, and the other one was named Fanny Doan, whom he named after Fanny Crosby. And those two ladies were instrumental in starting ABWE, the missions organization called American Baptist for World Evangelism. If you were to look at the history of it, you would find that there's pastors' names upon the, on the title of that thing, but it was those two ladies that did all the footwork and ran the office and were instrumental in starting that missions board. But somehow their children and their grandchildren got away from God. Change can happen very quickly. And it can infiltrate your family if we are not true to the word of God. So I want you to notice some things we notice in the scriptures today about change. And first thing we notice, I notice in verse 6, we see a patriarchal change. The patriarch died. The Bible says in verse 6 of our passage, and Joseph died. But notice this, and all his brethren and that generation. We know that Joseph had 12 brothers. His father had also died at the end of Genesis. And we see the 12 brothers who now uh, were, were the, the, the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, the Bible says they all died. They were all gone. I, I believe with all my heart that those 12 fathers had a great influence. 
Those 12 men that, that had come there, and though they had done evil in their youth and they had sold Joseph into slavery, were now being blessed by God. And, and God was using that situation and making their family a great nation. And, and God uh, used these men for influence over their children, but now they had died. I think if we were to look through history, we can see the pattern repeat itself. That often with great organizations, when the founder or the patriarch dies, things begin to crumble. I think back to the Bible college I attended, Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri. In 1950, a group of godly men gathered together and decided they wanted to form a Bible college. And some of those men, I remember as a boy preaching here at this church, but Brother W.E. Dowell uh, preached here, I remember, for anniversary services. Dr. R.O. Woodworth preached my high school graduation. Uh, Carl Boonstra was the head of the missions department. He preached missions conference here as a boy. And I remember these men that started this college. But let me tell you, when all those men died, you wouldn't send your dog to that school today. It's an absolute mess. How many of you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't, that McMaster University in Hamilton is actually a McMaster Baptist University? Anybody know that? McMaster University was founded by a pastor by the name of McMaster to train young men for ministry. They say that down in the basement, Pastor McLean is told me, you can go down to the basement, and they still have an archives of the old library of all these great books, theology books. Back in 1920s, in the 1920s, T.T. Shield got thrown off the board for the college because he warned then, you're going liberal. You're going in the wrong direction. And rather than listen, they threw him off the board and wanted nothing to do with him. Today, it's a great university for doctors and things like that. But you wouldn't hire a minister out of that school. As far as being a, a stalwart of the faith, it is no longer. It has fallen by the wayside. Often when the patriarch dies, we see that kind of decay. But only do we see a patriarchal change, we see also, secondly, a political change took place. The Bible says in verse 8, there arose up a new king who knew not Joseph. Joseph. That word no, I, I mentioned a minute ago, uh, has to do with, the, with an intimate relationship that they were close. Uh, perhaps he knew who Joseph was and he had heard maybe of his exploits and how they, he delivered the people of Egypt through this famine, time of famine. But he did not know him in the sense that he wanted to follow his ways. He didn't want to continue on honoring God. He had no desire in his heart to follow the way of the Hebrews. So we see a political change. This new Pharaoh was no longer going to be influenced by God's people. And so they were not being heard. I don't know about you, but I feel like that today. Not just in Canada, but around the whole world. God's people are not being heard. I want to I suggest to you today, that is nothing new. That is nothing new. For the vast majority of history, most Christians had to run for their lives. They've had to dwell in caves. They've had to hide in places underground to preach the gospel. They've been boiled in oil. They've been burned at the stake. They've been crucified. The first Christians, you read the Bible, and we say, what a flourishing time of Christianity. Those same Christians, many of them were put in lanterns to light Nero's gardens. They were the fuel that lit the fire. Anytime there's a political can change, listen to this, evil men shall wax worse and worse. I know we pray and we know we beg God and we ask God for Christian influence in our nation. Friends, let me say this, we, we need to start being the Christian influence in our nation. You are the salt of the world and you are the light of the world. We pray for a political leader and we say, God, bring a Christian in. No, you need to be that influence. Because when we lose that influence, we're going to be just like it is over in other countries, China and different places, just trying to survive and share Christ. We see a, four, a third change. We see a perception change. Look at verse 10. 
Come on, let us deal with them, lest they multiply. And it came to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. The people of Israel were once considered, and I don't say this in the same vein as Jesus Christ, the saviors of Egypt. Joseph devised a plan to preserve them through this, this drought. God helped them during a famine and, and elevated all the way to second in command and the rest of his family because of his legacy were welcomed in with open arms and given a land called Goshen to dwell in. But somehow the perception changed and now they were considered a threat. They're getting bigger. They're getting stronger. Let's put them under bondage in case they join with our enemies. Well, I've, I've never seen things change so quickly as I have in the last decade. You used to be able to stand and pre preach that homosexuality was a sin against the holy God. And we still preach that here. And listen, let me say this. That doesn't mean I hate anybody. That doesn't mean I hate them at all. I want them to see them saved. I want to see them come to Jesus Christ. They need the gospel. And so many people say when we preach against the sin, we're just hating people. But today, it's almost a hate crime to say anything like that. The word that comes flying out of their mouths is you're nothing but a bigot. No. Christ is holy, and we're supposed to live holy. Amen. And that, that sin is going to send you to hell. It's wrong today. To say that abortion is, is murder. By the way, I don't know if you know this. I heard this and learned this years ago. A, a preacher, a friend of mine, said that his wife had a miscarriage. And on the doctor's charts, he says, I, I was looking at this report, and it said that she had an abortion. And he says, no. He says, I, my wife did not have an abortion. He says, uh, he says they, they had moved and gone to a different church, and they had, uh, they had to pick up their doctor's, uh, uh, whatever you call it, their file, their, their patient file, and they had to take it with them to their new doctor. And then he was looking through it. And he says, I went to my new doctor, and I said, I want you to know that she never had an abortion. We, we don't believe in that. And the doctor says, that, don't, don't worry about that. He says, an abortion in the medical world, is literally any time a woman loses a baby. Your body has aborted that pregnancy. So he says whether it's a miscarriage or a doctor does it, whatever, that's called an abortion. He says what you are talking about, listen, is called aborticide. Do you know why the abortion crowd doesn't like that word? Because it sounds like homicide, suicide. Side is to kill or murder. That is what the real term for abortion is. It's aborticide. The world doesn't want to hear that. The world doesn't want to hear that. And here's where it's come today. They consider us a threat. We may not be a threat in the sense that we're going to overthrow a government or we're going to side with the enemy and march against them like we see in, in the, the Egyptians were worried about. But we're a threat to their way of life. We are seeing in the United States of America how abortion laws are being changed. The Supreme Court just overturned Roe versus Wade and put that law. That doesn't mean abortion stopped. It means they put that, the power back in the hands of the states individually. And many states immediately said, then we're done. We're not having any more abortions. They've been to closed clinics. What a wonderful thing. Oh, and they, they march and they get angry. Because the children of God have become a threat. One day it escalates. Here's the problem. It doesn't just say as a perception, it becomes persecution. And I, I, don't, believe, I, I, I don't believe as a child of God I'm persecuted. I'm so thankful I can stand up here and preach. And I, I can tell people about Jesus. And I, and I can preach the things I've talked about this morning. And, and I might get an email tomorrow. So what? I've got a delete button. Praise God. I'm not worried about that. But one day may come 
where we have to pay a dearer price. And we see that in the scriptures as well. It went from a perception change to a persecution change. Notice the next few verses. First of all, we see a persecution of burden. Verse 11. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pythom and Ramses. I like this. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. I wonder sometimes if we couldn't use a little persecution. If it wouldn't purify the church. If it wouldn't help us to get serious for God. So we see a persecution of burden, but then later on we see a persecution of brutality. The Bible says in verse 15, if you'll jump down there, and the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shipra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. Jump down to verse 22. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. First, it came as a perception change. They, they, they perceived Israel as a threat, and now they burdened them. But when they thrived, they'd begin to kill their children. We see a great change take place. But I want you to know, and I don't want you to ever think for a moment that God is not aware or that he does not care. God saw and heard the pain of Israel, and he knows about the plight of his children. But what are we to do? What are we to do? Change is always going to take place in our society. and I'm going to guarantee it's not going to get better. It's not going to get better. My, my son, uh, the police officer, told us this. He said, when Canada legalized marijuana, he said, the RCMP, he says, we all just went, oh. He says, they're not, he says, most of the RCMP are not saved people. They don't go to church or anything. He says, but they knew this, that they're the ones that have to clean up after a drunk driver killing somebody. And he says, now that they've legalized marijuana, he says, we're going to have double the deaths. He said, we're going to have to go and take bodies off the highway. We don't, we don't understand the damage it can cause. We've become a permissive society, and it's always going to get worse, and it's always going to change. So what are the children of God to do? Here's the challenge. Number one, the challenge of rising above the circumstances. Notice verse 11. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. They were successful people, weren't they? They went out and built cities. And look what it says next. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Oh, they made their lives bitter. Verse 14. In mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the fields, all their service wherein they made Them serve was with much vigor, but notice verse 12, they multiplied and they grew. You know, one of the the issues we have in our society today is that we get down so easily and nobody rises above circumstances anymore. Well, you don't understand, the preacher, there's just too many obstacles. My Bible says we're to be overcomers. We are victorious in Christ Jesus. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Oh, you don't understand the hard hearts in my workplace and why I can't ever tell people about Jesus. I see taskmasters set up and whips coming across people's backs and it was designed to limit the population and to keep them from being a threat and yet God blessed them and they multiplied and they grew. Let me say this, the people of Israel said, no excuses. We're going to have the best testimony for God that we can have. 
I've been there. I'm good at making excuses too. So many times, you say, well, we can't do that because of this or that. And, and, and don't get me wrong. No man should go to war unless he counts the cost. I understand. But there's a difference between a reason and an excuse. There's justifiable things that come in our lives and just say, well, we're, we're not able to proceed. God has shut a door. God is saying, I, can, I shouldn't go in that direction. But listen, don't allow excuses to take over your life and limit you from doing your best for God. The people of Israel, listen, they didn't just survive. They flourished. They grew. Oh, but I can't. By the way, this is just a side note. I'm so tired of people comparing leaders to Adolf Hitler. The Jews must be so sick of that as well. What we go through is not the Holocaust. The Jewish people are the most persecuted people that ever lived because they believe God. And maybe one day we will face some of what they faced over the centuries. Centuries. But right now, man, God has blessed us. And even when God blesses us, we can make excuses. Say, so God, well, I, I'd do that if. I'll teach a Sunday school class if, as soon as I get my PhD in theology. And Listen, do you know who the men were that turned the world upside down? They were unlearned and ignorant men, but you could see they've been with Jesus. That's what we need. So people that will grab on the hem of the garment. Some that will get alone with God and spend some time with him. So in the midst of change, the first challenge I see is the challenge of rising above the circumstances. You'll notice in Ephesians chapter 6, I'll just read it very quickly. The Bible says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? doesn't say fight. It's a stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. We are called to stand. Not to shrink like violets, but to stand for God in this evil day. The Bible says earnestly contend, but let me underline these next few words. For the faith. Not for our preferences or what we want, but for the faith of God. What are we standing for? The only offensive weapon you will find in Ephesians chapter 6 is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That is the weapon of our warfare. So we are to learn how to rise above the circumstances. Here's the second challenge I see in Exodus chapter 1. The challenge of retaining your character. Let me say that again. The challenge of retaining your character. Let me talk to the teenagers for a minute. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not here to insult you, but I'm going to tell you an honest truth. Do you know what the knock against your generation is? This is what all us old people perceive, a lack of character. I see a few heads nodding with me. A job is not important. Well, I'll show up and when I get there. And if I get fired, big deal, I'll find another one. Character, being on time. Well, you, you ask the staff around here, what's pastor's pet peeve? Being late. Oh, drives me crazy. Here, here's what I, I heard years ago. It's never a sin to be late, but it is a sin to be habitually late because you're saying my schedule is more important than everybody else's. What I'm doing is more important than what you're doing. Be on time. It doesn't cost you anything to be on time. When you start a job, finish it. When you give your word, keep it. When you make a promise, follow through. It's just, just simple character things. And we, all, we all need a challenge in that once in a while, but I want you to notice 
uh, the challenge of retaining your character when things are changing. Notice what it says in verse 15. And the king of Egypt speak to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shipra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, and by the way, those names mean beautiful and lovely. I don't think it's her real names. I think the people of Israel said these are beautiful and lovely women because they stood for God. Read on, verse, verse 16. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife and the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then he shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives went out and they had a confab one with another and they talked with their parents and they talked with leaders. No, what's it say? They feared God. They had character. They said, we're going to do right. We're not going to do that. I'm not talking about, they, didn't, they, didn't, they weren't about challenging some civic law. If there, if there was a curfew put in place for Israel and, and said, well, everybody's got to be in by 10 o'clock. We don't want anybody in the streets. They weren't challenging that. But when you went ahead and said, we want you to kill babies, they said, no way, because our God forbids that. We're not going to do it. They retained their character. The problem is, a lot of times in the midst of a shifting culture, the church shifts with it. Now, there's change in churches, too. Music changes over time. You know, we, if, if we went back to 1920 and sang some of the old hymns the churches were singing there, a lot of them, you wouldn't even understand the words. It would be very different. Very different style, a very different taste, and Different things are on the forefront. If you went back in the, in the midst of World War I and went to a church, I, I imagine the services would be very different. I bet there'd be a lot of more prayer during a church service back then. Things change over time. We don't, we don't, use, we don't use a whole lot of flannel graph in Sunday school anymore. Now it's video. I, I remember flannel graph. I'm just old enough to remember that. And when the flannel graph board was up, I thought, man, this is cool. That's how nerdy I was. Things change. But the word of God is forever. And God never changes. And the truth is not up for debate. When God gave his word and he never changes, that means his word is eternal. And we must obey it and follow it. And so the people, they, they had great character. And I, what did it start? They feared God. When the world was falling apart all around them, they maintained their integrity. They said, we're not going to change with the culture. The second challenge is the challenge to retain your character. Here's the third and final challenge I see amidst the world of change. The challenge of resting with contentment. The challenge of resting with contentment. I'm going I'm to share with you my biggest challenge in life. When somebody does something I don't like or gets in my face, my biggest challenge is keeping my mouth shut. That's hard. That's hard. You've probably all been there too where you've, you've shot off your mouth and went, oh man, that didn't go so well. It always sounds better in your head, doesn't it? Maybe you ought to keep it there. Always does. These women never shot their mouth off. They never got angry. They just said, walked away and said, I'm not doing that. Are you? No, I ain't doing that. I fear God. Yeah, me too. Well, what, what can Pharaoh do to us? Kill us? I'd rather stand before Pharaoh than a holy God any day, having killed children. They just rested contently in God. We need to be careful that when the world is going to chaos around us that we are content in Christ and we're resting in him. And listen, I don't know about you, but I still believe I have a sovereign God. That he's in control. I'm sure over the next 430 years or however long they were in, in total time they were in Egypt, 
as the tasks got harder and as babies began to die, cast into the river, the people might begin to moan and groan and wonder, where is God? And there would be complainers that would come out from among them. But I would hope and pray there was some that just rested in God. God knows what he's doing. God's still in control. God can take care of this. Here's what I know. Jesus Christ, that's a name above all names. God hath given him a name above all names. And that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And I don't know who you're mad at today. Are you mad at Justin Trudeau? Don't answer that. Just God has given Jesus a better name than Justin Trudeau. And one day Justin Trudeau will bow to him. Even your favorite politician, your favorite preacher, your favorite leader, they're all going to bow. Queen Elizabeth, I mentioned last week, her 70th year, she'll one day take off that crown and lay it at the feet of Jesus. Whether she's on her way to heaven or not, I don't know. But I know that her crown will be laid at his feet. He's a name above all names. Shipra and Pua walked away and said, we're just going to rest in God. I'm not going to worry about it. We're not doing that because we fear God. Notice what happened in verse 20. Therefore God dealt well with them, with the midwives. And the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. He increased their families. He gave them homes. He gave them children. It is likely, it is likely most midwives in Israel were single women that had been trained to birth until the time they got married because they could run out in the middle of the night. They could go help a lady. So it is possible, I'm not for certain, but it's possible these ladies were single ladies. But God gave them husbands, gave them children, and he built great houses for them. Can you think about that? Right in the middle of Egyptian bondage, when the taskmaster's whip was hard upon their backs, and chaos in the world is falling around all around them, God built them a great home because they feared God. Three challenges. The challenge to retain your integrity, the challenge to rise above the circumstances, and the challenge to rest with contentment. I'll close with this. But a week and a half ago, I guess that's kind of what stirred up my thoughts on this. A prayer request went out on BP Canada. BP Canada stands for Baptist Preachers Canada, and it's an email list, and there's about 200, 230 preachers, I think, on it, and we can share prayer requests across Canada and just whatever. And a prayer request went out and said, please pray for this specific bill. I don't even remember what it was now. It's been a couple weeks. And there's, there's, there's prayer requests like that every day almost. There's this bill coming in. It might be in Saskatchewan or it might be in a federal government, whatever. But there was a specific bill. Please pray for this bill. They had a vote on it, I guess, and I never heard how it went. And the next day somebody said, how, how did that turn out? Did, did anybody hear? And I, so I think it was a regional one in Saskatchewan. And somebody responded, well, it was this many for and this many against and we lost, and it's not the way we wanted it to go. And on and on it went. Several guys, well, this is terrible. This is horrible. This is awful. And I wondered in my heart, how come there's not one preacher praising God because God answered prayer? Well, it didn't go the way we wanted. Does that mean God didn't answer? Maybe God said no. You prayed. You gave it to God, and because it didn't turn out the way you wanted, we get to say it's wrong? Maybe it was God's will. There are some things in this life that we know are not God's will. If it was an abortion bill or something, I wouldn't be saying that. But if we have done all we can and given something to God, we need to learn to be content when it comes out the other side. Well, that's not what I would have done. 
Oh, but that's what God did. God told you no. Or God maybe said, not yet. There's more to learn from this circumstance. There, there's, there's more bondage. There's, there, there's more taskmasters. There's, there's more burdens to be placed upon you. Because one day, you're going to have to trust me so much that you'll see waters part. And one day, you're going to have to trust me so much for your daily bread falling from the sky. And one day, you're going to have to trust me so much that you won't even know where water's coming from, but I'll pour it out of a rock. I've got you in this place because I'm molding something in your life. Learn to rest in me. You need to learn to trust. Let's bow our heads this morning. God endorsed these two ladies, and it would be well for us to learn from their behavior. You'll never read their names again in the Word of God. Never again. But if you ask me, they're heroes of the faith. How many children were saved because of their behavior? Let's stand to our feet this morning and could I encourage you? Pray for our nation. Pray for our church that we'll always stand where we ought to stand. Pray for us individually. Pray for yourself that that when we handle situations, we'll handle it with grace. The wisdom of God. I know it wasn't necessarily a message where I shared the gospel explicitly, but if you've heard it before and you're just wondering, who is this God, this sovereign God you've been talking about? Maybe one of the songs, well, I like that third verse, tell me the story of Jesus. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, but tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, sweetest than ever was heard. Maybe you need to hear that story today and trust Jesus as your Savior. He died and paid the price for your sins so you don't have to spend eternity in hell. But you can know God through his son, Jesus, when your sins are paid for and washed away. Is there one said, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me? Is there one? For a minute, Pastor Paul's going to come and share some prayer requests with you. And I uh, hope you'll be here tonight. Of course, after our service tonight, we have our annual general meeting. And I look forward to sharing a good report with you what God did in the 2021 calendar year. Um, I'm going to ask Brother Tony and Lori, would you do me a favor and would you go to these doors over here and shake hands this morning? And uh, I'm, I'm not going to go there this morning. I don't want you to catch what I got. And that's usually a pretty good rule of thumb. You don't want what I got any day of the week. And so I'm going to have them shake hands, but if you have a need or anything, please share it with them, and they'll get that to me. I'm just going to kind of stay away from everybody this morning, okay? Lord bless you.